the edge with April Mahoney brains. Here, this is the place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. <laughs> Welcome home, brains. Coming to you straight from San Diego, California. Let's welcome our host, April Mahoney. Welcome back to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. You are home at the spot, the place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. We're going to talk about love today, and we're going to go deep. We're going to talk with a family and marriage therapist, Sarah Cook Ruggiero. 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 Girl, I tell you, she's going to give me $25 if I get that name right. <laughs> Ruggiero. But she's awesome. You know check, check. Get rid of the two Gs and just put a J. R-U-J-E-R-A. Then you'll get it. Ruggiero. Ruggiero. So, okay, Ruggiero brains. Okay, so I got it now. <laughs> she married into that name, okay? But yeah. we're, we're going to talk about some real, real heartfelt stuff because people are at a quandary. They're in their relationship and they're saying to themselves, should I stay or should I go? Is it worth me staying? You know, what about the kids? What about the house? What about the car? What about my self-worth? What about my value? What about the bruises on my heart? You know, what about sexual indiscretions? We're going to ask her about that. And what are the most key uh, components in making that decision? Should you stay or should you go? So without further ado, I want you to welcome her. There she is right there, Sarah Ruggiero, Ruggiero, <laughs> E-I-G-I-O. <laughs> Ruggiero, you're cool. Ruggiero, I don't know why I, don't, I can't get that, but I'm here with you, and thank you so much for being patient with me, Sarah. Uh, but I want you to talk to my brains about something that's very serious, and that's about relationships. Let's start with your, you know, with your beginning and your history, a little bit about you know, how you even pick this population uh, to work with, because it's tough. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons I became a marriage counselor, it, it can happen to a lot of people. They, certain personal, personal situations come up, and then you learn from that, and then you want to help people with what, I want to help people with what I went through. So I, I'm, I'm born in an Asian family, or a Filipino culture family, where dependency is uh, what's taught rather than independent. So for a long time, as, as much as I've been, been told that I have all this confidence, I didn't feel it inside. And so I lived at home until I was 24 years old. And then I went from my mother and father's home to my husband, my first husband's home and uh, married for certain reasons at that point, which I now realize are not reasons to get married, although I love and care about this person. So Throughout the course of the marriage, uh, I, I differentiated, became more different from the family that raised me and different from my first husband. And so a lot of turmoil in that. I didn't have the tools to know how to initiate conversation, share thoughts and feelings, ask for what it is I needed and wanted. And so I kept all that inside of me and then it eventually came out because I kind of grew up and this newly found Sarah, uh, it didn't, didn't know how First of all, the, the old Sarah didn't know how to be in the relationship because I didn't have the tools. And the new Sarah had all the acquired tools to know what she wanted. And so had to go through the whole divorce thing. So I kind of know what the saying, should I stay or should I go? Uh, being married for nine years, um, I, left, I left three times, came back three times. And my husband, my ex-husband and I joke about it. But that's how I grew up. That's how I learned how to be more independent, be more me. And, but it was a very grueling decision uh, in that we had a three-year-old, so um, it was it was very it was very challenging time at that point. Because I wanted to stay together. Parents, you know, you're you're influenced, especially in our culture, you're influenced by your family, then the right. children. And, and at the at the time, I really didn't. I was kind of dependent on my husband financially in that I had a college degree, but I didn't really do anything with it. I, I just helped him with build his business, and then when he was set. I kind of felt a little envious, if not jealous, and that, that was part of the differentiating process and me growing up and becoming my own sense of self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I understand it's very difficult to leave a relationship. I mean, we still love each other, but we're not in love with each other. I'm not in love any longer, but there's still that care. So when I work with my people and they say they don't know if they should stay or go, a lot of people come in because there are um, 
really bad communication problems, like you said, uh, infidelities, financial infidelities, uh, sexual, emotional infidelities. And so people need to know if, they, if, if, it, can, if it can be uh, fixed. Bottom line, though, is as it was for me, it, it was a choice to move on because um, my choice was, number one, uh, with the way I perceived things, I saw things in a, a different way. And we, the grown-up self, although I, I could have continued to work on it, chose not to for all of my valid reasons. And everybody has their valid reasons. Right, 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 right. So, so my people that come in basically do the should I stay or should I go? And a lot of them come in because their spouses are verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. Affairs, of course. I do affair recovery. Financial recovery is a big one as well. Right. So that's pretty well, much a what I do. There's a lot of there's a lot of trickery. Thank you. Here's to you. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of trickery going on out there. You know, people think, you know, they really think that they're doing something behind their spouse's back. Male brains, let me tell you, your cell phone is your worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Could be for females too. Could be for females too, April, right? Yeah, but I mean, usually most men get busted by their cell phone. Yeah. They're, you know, they're texting, they're taking pictures and leaving messages, all of that. Yeah. The hardest part of a relationship in discretion, I think, is when people fall emotionally attached to a person. The physical, you know, a lot of times I hear that people aren't as connected to the, the, the sexual intimacy, but when they're in your head, when you're falling emotionally uh, in love with them and you're confiding in them and consoling in them and reaching out to them, that's really something hard to break. So tell us a little bit, using your diagram, on the structure of these relationship paradigms and who are the key players and what are the key components? Sure. Key players, um, in my uh, professional opinion, are the individuals, because uh, as you continue to live your life, you, you continue to be the person that you're going to be, but you continue to differentiate from all the relationships that you uh, started off with and progress with. And, and you, when I say differentiate, in, in a good way, uh, in, a, in a way that's appropriate and that works uh, for you, because there's always adjusting to different relationships. So the key component then is if the individual is healthy and they meet another healthy individual, meaning identify and exercise appropriate behavior, be able to initiate conversation, share thoughts and feelings, ask for what it is that you need and want, that's healthy. So that, to me, that's like, that's the foundation. If you can't even do that, then, then you still need to grow up. Okay, so I give them the tools to be able to do that. Okay. Once they've got traction and knowing how to communicate more effectively, and you communicate more effectively using those three things that I just pointed out, then you talk about what it is that you want and, and, and envision what you want your life relationship to look like. So, and, and everybody does that. Um, I talk to people in premarital counseling. They, they always want the obvious things, happy life, happy uh, security, financial security, uh, always wanting to feel in love. Okay, so that, that's, that's great. So if you don't have the foundation, then I, then I, I think you're going to have a challenge. And some people meet one another knowing they don't have the foundation, yet they still think they're going to move forward. And that's where the problems come. Okay. Then, then there's the infidelities because then you're not getting your needs met in your own relationship. Because right. one, you don't know how. If you do know how, then what people, a lot of people step out because they start, they don't really want to feel vulnerable with their partner because vulnerable, I don't know about you, but growing up, vulnerability, saying I was sad or hurt meant I was weak. I don't, I encourage that, number one, to be vulnerable. It's not weak because when you're vulnerable and, and you're able to say what you really need to say to your partner, the intimacy comes about. And so when people step, so, so when people step out, they're, they're talking about their thoughts and feelings with other people. They're beginning, they're being more vulnerable with other people and then bam, there goes the connection and then they think they like them more than their significant partner. And you know, what I hear a lot of times Sometimes, you know, young women are taught from early age to marry up. So in other words, marry up, get someone that's going to take care of you. Uh, don't worry about, you know, the intimacy. Don't worry about your needs because the money's going to take care of everything. Uh, you're going to have a roof over your head. Your kids are going to go to the best schools. You'll be able to shop. You'll have the diamonds, all that kind of stuff. But your heart is never fulfilled. 
Then you have the other relationships where you have the martyr. You have uh, the person that is going to take care of you or they're going to, you know, they, I don't need you to work. I, I just need you to be a good housewife or a good house husband and I'll take care of everything else. Then the other spouse has a sense of, you know, lower self-worth. There's other times where people just want attention. So many times people are career oriented or mothers are really into their children that they forget about the intimacy, about the connection. And it doesn't have to be sexual brains, just a little cuddle, a little nudge, a little holding hands, some public uh, display of affection can go a long way. So when you run into these situations and you have these type of clients and say, for example, we'll jump right in. It's a sexual indiscretion. What are some of the things that I want you to explain some of the things that people need to outline? Because you know what? That's a deal breaker for me. We're not having no menage a trois. The three of us are not getting in the bed together. You know, folks come home with a kid. They come home with a sexually transmitted disease. How am I supposed to get over that? I, I, I've seen I've seen every situation, yes. Yeah. And again, without judging or criticizing, I, I understand why the affair partner, there's an affair partner who does the cheating, and then there's the hurt partner who obviously had was cheated on. So I understand why the affair partner does what they do, albeit I don't condone it in any way. A lot of the times the people in, in happy, it could be happy marriages or not happy marriages. Having sexual affairs isn't even about sex. It's, yes, sex is involved, but it's really not all about that. It's what the affair partner wanted in that third person. And I all I hear all the time, they wanted to feel attractive. They wanted to feel wanted. They wanted to feel, they wanted to feel like they were the, the priority in the relationship. And again, as, as for women, let's say women are wives. If you work, you're a career, career person and you're a mom. And then you're a community person. You've got extended family. And then sometimes husband is low on the priority. And that's where I say relationships are just as hard as working your own livelihood job. Okay. And, and if it's too much work, then you know what? Don't expect the long-term peace. I was people grow together because they do. They have to do the work. And, and you know, we, we see our parents and we, and we, yeah, we laughed at them in the past, but hey, my, I know my parents, they're still married 70, 65 years. Mm. And I saw some weird stuff, but hey, it was a choice. They right. made behavioral adjustments because nobody's perfect. I saw, I saw the little bit of fighting. I saw the inappropriate behavior, but you're supposed to do a Whenever there's something wrong in a relationship, you're supposed to ask for a behavioral change and then make the adjustment. If not, well, well, right? If, right. if so, more power, more power to you. Well, let me ask you a question. Sure. Because this has really uh, baffled me. Now, I've been married 35 years, and he is the closest thing to perfect that I could find for me. But folks change their mind, and they get weird. And so I've always told him as well as told myself that I leave about that much more for me in the event, yeah, in the event that we got to do an exit. I mean, you don't want that, but I want to be able to be whole. I want to be able to be, uh, make good decisions. I want to be financially secure. I want to be able to love him enough that in the event that we do part, that I don't hate him, try to hurt him, all that kind of stuff, that I want him to still continue to be a whole person after 35 years. But I got some friends that are getting divorced, three of them, and they are in their 80s. 80 years old, yes, girl. Yeah, they have been, one of them was married 61 years. And I'm just wondering what, how intense could that be? That after you've been with somebody for 61 years and you are in your 80s, that you want to go in front of a magistrate and say, you know what? I don't want to die with this person. I want a divorce. Hmm. It's just, it's really, really heartbreaking. I mean, I guess enough is enough, right? Enough is enough. Um, if she came into my office, I'd first of all assess, first of all, what, what's it, what was it, what's her age? Uh, 86. One of them is 86. The other one is 84. The other one is 81, and I've got a friend that was on my show. She's getting married, and she's 83. Okay, okay, see, because we are no longer in a patriarchy society, society, women are coming into their own sense of uh, power, and better late than never, because I'm sure these people, these 
year old women kind of grew up in the what is it the greatest generation uh, uh, stage where yeah their life was their spouse was their husband yeah well America was great again right <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Let you back 50 years. You was burning your bra. You didn't have no right to vote. All of that. Yeah, that's, that was them. That was them. Yes. And they, they, they probably felt it. They probably felt they were property rather than an equal partner. And, right. and they, maybe they came into their own sense of self, power, and that's, that's a, a wonderful feeling. And maybe at this point, they just want to, they just want to do me, to do me instead of anybody else. I'm sure they got grandkids, grown children, but then it's like, you know, I want to do me. And this is their chance to do it. And sometimes a legal divorce, because it's legal on paper, psychologically helps them be able to just do that. I'm going to just, yeah, I'm just going to do me. I'm tired of doing everybody else, being the caretaker, being the placator, being the yes ma'am. Right. And so I can see, I, I can see their point of view. I mean, everybody's perspective is, is, is validated. Right. But wow, but yeah, yeah, in your yeah, wow. And then you know what? It's unfair of me to automatically assume that because they're in their 80s, that they haven't made a conscious decision, that they, you know, that they don't want to be with this person, that they right. want to be independent. So you have a really great diagram. I want to roll back a little bit. Can you share that with my brains and explain okay. what that is? Yeah, just hold it up there for a few minutes. So let me uh, give them a good eyeball shot of you, okay? And this is the diagram. And explain that to us, please. Okay, so again, individual in a relationship is the most important. Everybody, everybody hears about this Venn diagram, so I'm gonna talk about the Venn diagram. But in life, a healthy relationship, the individual needs to meet their own personal needs and in a good way. But it's a me, myself, and I. You gotta be whole, you gotta be 100%er. A lot of people come in and they're in a relationship, but they're still running off of 75%. I don't know. I don't care how old they are. 75 percenters. But our, our life is to continue to evolve, to, to, make, to be that 100%, whatever that is as an individual. Because then that individual brings all that energy into the individual within the relationship. Okay. So number two priority is the individual in the relationship. Number three priority is the relationship and all the good things that come in with, uh, with what the two bring in terms of the, the, the me's are being entwined and becoming the we, okay? So then here are the offspring. So if you don't role model it in the right way, I'm taking care of myself as an individual, I'm taking, myself, taking care of myself as an individual in the relationship, the relationship needs to role model how to be healthy with a good foundation so that you role model it for your kids so that they know how to do it. Now, what you said, some people kind of tend to lose the intimacy here, so then they step out, whatever. Sometimes, some people, and I know in the Filipino population, they do this, where the children, the offspring are number one priority. And then guess what, right? And then your the relationship is affected, and then the individual becomes an unhappy camper, and then they role model how to be a grouch, how to be resentful, how to right. not be happy in life. And, and then they become angry people. And then you role model how to be angry. So your kids know how to do that. And they do it really well. Okay, so. What were, what, so tell me, give me your questions with regards to just what I said. In terms so, of. So when you're role modeling, okay, because mm -hmm. I remember my daughter telling me, she was like six years old. She said, mommy, I watch every single thing you do. See? See that? Yes. Right. And so they, so many times the kids don't know that we're having problems. The kids don't know that we're having financial problems. Uh, they don't know that, you know, that uh, mommy and daddy are arguing. They don't, we never argue in front of the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is internal. These children are ingesting that because right. they don't speak to it. They can't mm -hmm. speak to it. They got to stay in their own lane, but yeah. they are mimicking these w behaviors when they see, uh, you know, violence in the household. The young men may think that this is a way to keep his woman in line. Right. Uh, right. When young women see that their mothers are violated, they may feel that this is a role that they need to play to be submissive. Right, exactly. So there's a lot going on there. And then you have the outside noise of the family. Girl, yeah. now you talked about, you know, your culture. I can talk about mine, because I got a couple of them. 
right? Chiming in and don't have no business, don't know what they're going on with. They're going to try to uh, dictate who should do what and That's what should, based off what they think. And the thing is, there's a saying that you don't marry the family. Some cultures, you do marry the family. Other right. cultures, you marry the individual. How do we find a balance there? How do we keep folks out of our relationship and learn to just kind of work imano imano, spouse to spouse? Great. Okay, very, very good question. Okay, first of all, right, we role model to our children the behavior. So whether whether you do it um, explicitly, where they see the behavior in terms of the bad behavior, or um, whether they whether you they're going to know because what I'm trying to say is they're going, they have this instinct and they know what's going on with their mother and father. And so if there's tension, they're going to feel the tension. If there's uh, relaxation, comfort, comfort, they're going to feel that. You don't even have to, you don't even have to demonstrate it to kids. They intrinsically, they feel it when there's tension between mother and father, when, they're, when people are giving each other the silent treatment. Okay. So next with regards to the external family. Okay. That's why it's very important to put boundaries in place. See all these lines? They're boundaries. Now. That's right. Because right. I will put a stop sign up in a heartbeat. Tell them to slow their roll. That's right. Because here they are, mom, dad, whatever, whatever. Boundaries. They are now your extended family. This is the flow chart. That's your family. That's your family. They can come in here. Because in the, in the unshaded area, the individual in the relationship should be having their own kind of gig going, life in terms of work, hobbies, friends, but in an appropriate way, okay? You want to do that in the, because you want to continue to keep your sense of self and, and then uh, uh, deposit it in the relationship. So that's why it's important to get, some, get those issues resolved. But yeah, so yeah, there are issues. Sometimes parents tell you how to raise kids. Tell them what to eat. What, what, <laughs> tell, you, tell you how to decorate your home. Tell you how to wear, what, what to wear. No. Oh no, girl, they go no. they far into it. How to spend your money, who That's you check in with, who yeah. your, you know, thinking that they was in the relationship and who the baby's daddy is and who their mama is. And <laughs> I like the old girlfriend and all that. Girl, they can come up with some crazy <laughs> stuff. And it really makes but it makes for a hostile environment. Okay, it really makes yeah. for a hostile environment. And me and Mr. Magnificent had made, you know, before we even set our vows, we had set some boundaries on, you know, folks living with us extending money, extending time, that conversation, all of that. Those boundaries were set. And it's hard because yeah. a man loves his mother. I know. It's a I key know. indicator, well, what I found anyway, is how a man treats his mother is normally how he's going to treat his wife and his woman. You know, I've, I've yes. seen it. Yes. 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 And yeah, I mean, that's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a, a, a template, but for the most part, you can see but for the how, most part, yeah. right. How they feel yeah. about that you know when a young girl looks at her father you know my daughter absolutely adores my husband she thinks that he can do no wrong but mm. that is the role model that she is looking for when she's mm. finding a suitor and so she sees right. them together and she sees the yin and the yang and yeah. how we complement one another so it and it's very difficult you know when you have those outside influences so brains you got to establish some boundaries you Boundary. know if you're working on your relationship you got to get everybody else out of it and it's got to be you and the person that you have that relationship with let me ask you this cuz everybody's going to want to know this okay how do you stay connected when somebody done stepped out on you you know, again, now there's there's two kind of stepping out. One is physical and one is emotional. When they got that emotional attachment, you're dealing with a whole different ball game. So give us some suggestions. How to stay connected when there's betrayal. Right. Okay. How to stay connected when there's betrayal. Those two people have to go through a fair recovery. Okay. I'm sorry is not a fair recovery. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Trust me, it's not a fair recovery. There's a process that you go through where you uh, understand the means and motives of what went down in your relationship. Right. You, have to be able, you have to be able to talk about it and honestly. Uh, and, and, and if you can do that, and I'm talking about honesty in terms of get down and really talk about what, what's happening. Um, you might, we all, a lot of people say, oh, we look good on the outside, but then 
uh, between the two of us, we didn't have any intimacy because you didn't talk to one another in a way to make yourselves open, vulnerable, and so no intimacy. So in moving forward with a betrayal, I help them answer some really hard questions. And a lot of them do have a hard time. A lot of people cannot say, I am hurt. When you did that, it disappointed me. A lot of people can't do that. All they say is, hey, I'm out of here. Get out. That's all they say. Because it's a fight or flight. So rather than fight or flight, I have them sit down and know how to express themselves. So, so I say, when you say, fuck you, get out of here, what are you really saying? Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so hurt by this. Let's stop doing this. Because mm -hmm. I'm tired of saying, fuck you, get out of here, right? right. So a lot, of, a lot of this acting out behavior does not make for an intimate relationship. So I'm sure you and your husband don't talk to each other like that. And, and if you do, you- Oh, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't swear. No. If I, and if I want to swear, I grab my purse, get in my car, and I'll just go at it. But I talk to him with dignity, and I talk to him with respect as a man, and he has never said anything crazy to me, Ooh. never called me out of my name, never raised his hand at me. Not that he's supposed to, but yeah. 35 years, now y'all you, you know brains, I can be a hot mess. But I don't provoke that kind of um, kind of conversation. I get real quiet. And that's when it's really scary because then I'm thinking. You know, I'm processing. But then I also try to put myself in his shoes. I try to be him for a minute and think, okay, was this intentional? Or was this just a, you know, an air hair, uh, airhead moment? Was this a mistake in judgment? Did he really not know? Give the other person because they love you. Yeah. They love you. They Give them the benefit of the doubt instead of just being so angry. Another thing that you said, two things I want to uh, talk about. One is acceptance. Okay? This is a double-edged sword, brains. There's two players in here. Don't think that it's all one person's fault. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, you got to accept responsibility for the things that you did. Are you a verbal abuser? Do you cuss the person out? I can't stand that. Do you always want to argue? Do you, are you, you know, sneaking in clothes and stuff and you know that you don't have the money? You know how women do that in the trunk of the car, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, are you a snoop? You know, now these people are really tripping. They putting these tracking devices on folks. You know, I had a family member and I got another friend. If you put a tracking device on me, it's on and popping. Okay? No, just pass me out to, you know, no, no, no. I, I don't like that. It's, you know, there's mm -hmm. deceit there. And then there's another thing that I want to talk about is this word trust. That word trust is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. That word trust can hold you hostage. Yep. Okay, so we've had a problem and you stepped out on me. So now you want to go to the bar with the boys and have a burger. So every time you go out, I've got to come out with this statement. Okay, well, if you do this and you don't call me at a certain time, I can't trust you anymore. So no, it's not about trust because I'm a grown ass woman, okay? Yep. I'm gonna do what I want to do. But if I give you my word and we're rebuilding a relationship, you have to be open enough to allow me some space, okay? And not always hold me hostage with this word trust because that doesn't mean anything. So now every time I do anything, it's got to be contingent upon your approval and your trust. How do we get past that? Okay, so, so April, like you said, you don't want to police your husband. Nobody wants to police their husband. They don't want to be doing the detective work. Right. If you're going to put that much energy in doing weird stuff, put the energy in knowing how to communicate more effectively. Put, in, put energy into knowing how to express yourself um, more appropriately. Share your feelings. Share your thoughts. Okay? So... You are able, with what you just said, you're able to do that because you're more developmentally mature. A lot of people who can't do this, they want to have a, a developmental uh, immaturity. Or that's where I help them kind of beef it up, knowing, trying to like grow themselves up emotionally so that they know how to act. Because you're right. Trust is, uh, if I say I'm going to do something, then behaviorally, I'm going to follow through. Right. You, you can do a lack of trust or that you say you're going to, take out the trash and then you don't, okay, that, that adds to lack of trust. When you say something, you better follow through or there's no trust. So a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, I always say behavior is the truth. Words, no. Girl. Right? Yeah. I don't, mm -mm. no, because I'll tell you what, if let's say your, your, our husbands did do that, when I said, oh, I'm going, I'm going out for a burger with the guys, fine, my God, have fun. And then if he's really being, uh, 
good. It's, uh, he's really having uh, a, a good uh, intentions of moving forward in this betrayal recovery. He's going to say, yeah, and I'm, I, I can imagine you thinking I'm going to do something weird because I did it last time, but you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm cool. So please just know that I'm, at least acknowledge that I'm feeling a little insecure. See, because when you take the burden off of the hurt partner, that develops trust too. Exactly. You gotta say it first. You're watching a you're watching a movie and there's and there's all these affairs going on. And then so the husband, let's say the husband uh, says, oh, if the husband says, oh, is this the movie gonna um, make you feel uncomfortable? Because you know what I, I kind of did. And then that's gonna build trust for the hurt partner because it's like, wow, you took the burden off of me. You took right. the burden. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. But you said but it first. Also, the person that is that's vulnerable. Free yourself. Yes. Every time somebody does something, you are not their detective. You are not their parent. Right. You are their partner. partner. And so what you have to say is, okay, this happened. I'm going to store it in the database, but I'm not going to snoop around looking for yeah. something else because what you're going to no. do is you're going to push them away. If you are looking to rebuild yeah. your relationship to create a stronger foundation, because mm -hmm. what don't kill you make you strong, okay? Right. If you're looking right. for that, what you need to do is work through the process, but you got to work on yourself. You yeah. cannot be following them. You can't be calling people. You can't be showing up at their job because what right. you're doing is you're looking for trouble. That's what you're looking yeah. for. And then when you find it and you know, you're know you vulnerable, then this person's not going to want to be with you. Yeah. So it's, right. really, it's really, really challenging. All right. So now they're in this relationship. Uh -huh. And they're rebuilding their trust. They're, real, they're rebuilding their foundation. They're communicating more. Yep. It's the intimacy. Because, you know, intimacy is very important in a relationship. People have polyamorous relationships where they're with more than one person. They have open relationships. I got some friends that have a divorce. She got the ups, uh, upstairs part of the house. He's got the bottom. I've got other people that live down the street from one another. You don't have to be ugly. But how do you regain that intimacy? Because you know, you have these little sugar plums dancing in your head. Oh, okay, well, he, you had sex with them. You don't need to know every nano thing. Well, did you do this and did you do this? And do, you can't compare. How do you rekindle that kind of love and bring sexy back into the relationship after an indiscretion? You're right. You don't want to ask for details. Excuse me. Details are not helpful. You want to know meaning and motive of behavior. That's gonna help a person understand you as an individual where you get deep in terms of sharing what it is that you didn't get of the relationship that you kind of want and that you kind of got with that third person, okay? And so you're right about the, um, don't go to their office, don't keep blowing up their phone. Concentrate on yourself, Concentrate. what am I doing that's making it better or not good? Have some self-focus to know how you limit yourself or contribute in any situation in your relationship, okay? In, in terms of exterior boundaries and interior boundaries. The interior boundaries means if somebody asks me for something and I say yes when I really meant no, I, I just crossed an interior in, internal boundary, which is not a good thing for anybody to do. So in rebuilding trust, moving forward in, a, in an affair, developing intimacy between a husband and wife, no matter if you're a newlywed or married for 65 years, Go out every now and then as a boyfriend and girlfriend, not husband and wife. Boyfriend, girlfriend. Meaning, don't go out to dinner in your house clothes, okay? Put on the lipstick. Put on some cologne, dude. Don't wear your sweats. Right. Put some effort into it. Effort is attractive. Effort is what makes it hot. Saying what you really need to say in and out of the bedroom is hot. Yeah. Fantasies are hot whether you follow through with them or not. People are like, oh, I'm too prudy. I don't have a fantasy. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You have a fantasy. And they're, often, they're, they're, often, they're, often, and they're oftentimes raunchy. <laughs> so, so, yeah. But who, oh, I, I'm, I can't say that to you. I'm going to look like a not good person. I'm going to look like a, I don't know, mm. what or whatever. Oh, okay. you know what? Madonna whore is what makes it hot. Sorry. You've got to be presentable outside of the bedroom. But in the bedroom, okay, it's only if you want to. Okay? Only if you, whatever it is that you want, if you do, you're going to feel pretty damn happy with, with one another and content. You can't reconnect if you're going to continue to hide things. What I want in bed, what I want out of bed, what I want to say, what I really want to say. No. Saying what you really need to say, it's, it, as easy as it is, right? It, it, it's hard for me. 
it's still hard for me to, to ask for something because I'm so such a tough image. Oh, I, I, I tell my clients, I'd rather walk two miles than ask somebody for a ride. I'd rather t- go find a payphone than ask for a cell phone. But you know what? In my relationship, I have to say, you know what? I'm feeling really, really tired right now. Can you go run these errands for me, please? Oh, my God. Oh, oh, yeah. 20 years, oh, 20 years ago? No way. I'm going to do it all. Yeah. I'm going to show you guys. No. And, you know, I'm you, what happened in the, the, the Black community, uh, late 70s, early 80s, is that the woman became so strong and the man mm-hmm. was emasculated. Right. He lost his place. And the worst thing that you could tell somebody brings is that I don't want you. I don't need no man. Oh, okay. God. I don't tell Mr. Magnificent that. No. I tell him please and thank you and I love you yeah. and I appreciate you and I need you. Yep. You know, whether I can do it myself or not, everybody, if you're in a relationship, wants to be wanted and wants to be needed by the other person. Another yeah. thing that people do in relationships is scorecard. You know, oh, they yeah. keep yeah. They, you know, they keep in uh, track on, and you know, you did this and we did this. And do you remember blah, 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 blah. all of that is irrelevant. Deal with the situation at hand, whatever it was Now you know, if it's reoccurring, of course, now you got the data collected in the background. If you're seeing a pattern of behavior, then, you know, deal with that. But, uh, well, I saw this and I saw that and I, you know, and we did this and we had this, that was an argument six months ago. Yep. It has no relevance as to what it is now. Do you agree, Sarah? Very much so. Those are the most challenging couples that come in. They, they keep going through this loop over and over and over again, knowing that they have the tools to be to implement, to make it better, but they, they still keep going over and over and over. And so I say to them, you can't help yourself because you who would want to continue this loop. Right. So that's why I say some of these people need some individual work so they can learn how to grow up. We did. You did. I did. That's why we know how to be in a relationship. You don't do the tit for tat. You don't bring up stuff that have already been resolved. I mean, who does that but kids, okay? You want to show appreciation, thankfulness. Men and women want to, they want you to want, they want you to want them, okay? And don't just want me. I want you to feel it in your, in your, in your heart. I, you want to want to stay in this relationship, okay? And so, Oftentimes, again, the, the, there's, a kind of, there's a lot of individual work within uh, couples counseling, but the individual will eventually, hopefully, integrate that in moving forward and developing a new relationship if the first one sucks. Because marriages, we have three or four different marriages in a lifetime because you keep, like you said, you keep changing, you keep evolving. What, what was 10 years ago, your marriage is different from the, from the next, from the first 20. First 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You could, you know, you've been married for 35 years, three decades. You guys were different. And that's, and you talked about how you want to change and what the vision is like. So don't, people don't unilaterally do weird things because you're in a relationship. Okay. If you're single, do whatever you want. Don't make unilateral decisions right. outside, of the, outside of the relationship. And so unilateral means, hi, I'm having an, I'm having an affair. Uh, and I'm not telling you so. I unilaterally made a decision to have an open relationship. Well, you didn't tell your wife that. Right, right. <laughs> and then you put me in the bed with you guys, and you come up with an STD, okay? And oh, I'm God, in jail. Yeah. yeah, then I'm in jail because I done bust you, crushed your nugget. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making time for counseling after all of that. No, no, no. That's that is a deal breaker. Okay. Totally. So, you have given us such valuable tips. This has been such a fun conversation. Girl, oh you, know I, you know I ain't playing, and he know I ain't playing too. <laughs> love, love is a many splendid things. Look at these two right You know? It's, it's, not, it's not a lot of, you know, ebbs and flows, okay? And so what Sarah has shared with us is that, number one, is communication, brains. Say what you mean and mean what you say. You yes. are the person that you proclaim to love. You should be able to say anything to them, good, bad, or indifferent. Sometimes the truth hurts, but mm-hmm. at least they know exactly where you're coming from. And then once you've done that and then things are not working out, then you have option number two. After you communicate, that's the communication between you and your partner, not you and outside influences, be it family, work, friends, cousins, all right. 
They don't belong in your relationship, okay? Be careful what you say around your children because your children are sponges. They're going to absorb all of this and it's going to impact their relationships moving forward. And truth be known, it's going to impact their relationship with you because they're looking at how you deal with life and how you process things. Mm -hmm. Also, be careful with that word trust, okay? It's not a weapon, okay? It is a gift to be able to trust someone and to let them be a part of your life. Don't be a control freak. Make your own money. Make your own way. And if you can't, go and see Sarah because she knows exactly what to say, what to do, and how to help you develop the tools to develop your own diagram to get through that. So in closing, Sarah, please share with my brains some wisdom, some encouragement when they're at that place of saying, should I stay or should I go? And then how to get in contact sure. with you. Sure. Should I stay or should I go? Again, make sure the relationship has a healthy relationship. Make sure the relationship has a set healthy foundation because healthy breeds healthy. Unhealthy needs some work. If you're saying, please learn to be more appropriate and they don't, your hands are tied. It's a choice. So if you want to live with somebody who's not healthy uh, relationally, that's your choice. But you need to know how to manage your emotions, share thoughts and feelings, ask for what it is that you need and want. Put boundaries in place. I always say to my husband when I'm talking to him, well, that person is boundaryless. Or, or I'll say to my daughter, oh, your friend, as much as your friend, as much as I love your friend, she's kind of doing this boundaryless thing. And, then, and it, it, you know, in a nice way, I'm, I'm saying, hey, put some boundaries in place. You know, where, where, do you, where do I end and you begin? Okay. So and then in conclusion, if I don't do... I've been doing this for 25 years, okay? I am in my second marriage. It's, it's very, very dynamic now, and it's, it works for me. It's, it's a wonderful relationship. I don't, I don't do, I don't give anybody tools that I don't myself use. I, I, I use that's why I develop, I, I, I have, I'm eclectic in my, um, in what I use, utilize in terms of my uh, process in, in giving out tools. I know what works because I've done it. And so if anyone is interested in kind of knowing what kind of work I do, I do have uh, in ways to contact me. Can I show you this? Can you see it? Yes, hold it. Now, wait, hold it still. You got to hold it still because you got to give folks time to get their glasses. That's right. Pull it, down off, pull it down off your face a little bit. Okay. And now, okay, perfect. Now, read that to us. What is it saying? It says, Sarah Cook Ruggiera, licensed marriage family and count, licensed marriage therapist, helping people who ask the question, should I stay or should I go? Mm -hmm. I have the website there. If you do the website, you'll find the blog. I, I write about, I have over 300 blog articles that talk about what we just talked about today. Okay. Um, the phone number is there as well. I do internet uh, chats for those of you that are not in town. But yeah, I, I have a good... I personally have a good uh, a success success rate in that my clients give me the feedback and they say that it works. It's doing some good. It does. And talk therapy, it works, brains. Keep your hands to yourself. You don't be hitting <laughs> on nobody. You know, <laughs> keep that alcohol and drugs under control or get help for that. You know, tell your mother-in-law uh, or your mother that you don't live with her no more, that you got a spouse. And that, yeah. you do that, you know, all of those wonderful things. But uh, Sarah, you have just been a wealth of information and I appreciate you and I value you and you're up the street. We're going to have some coffee. Okay. Yeah. We're going gonna 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 to talk about the coffee place with our coffee mugs. Okay. Like it's the right thing to do. I thank you so much. And this is an ongoing conversation. I want you to come back. Yeah. We're going to follow up this with a happiness mm -hmm. coach. And uh, she's going to be coming to us from Canada, and she cool. is going to be talking about, okay, so you decide to stay, and so how are you going to bring happy back? Well, you, but, you better start with sexy, okay? <laughs> get, your, right. get, your, get your sexy on, okay? And, you know, if you're doing some online dating, just a word to the wise, you better be careful, okay, and know who you're talking to, because you can get catfished. That's another show. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much, uh, Sarah. Um, you just... 
You're wonderful. And I think well, thank you so, you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. You're yeah. funny. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm going to put all of her information in case you, if you couldn't see it clearly, we're going to put it at the bottom. We're okay. going to definitely follow through. Uh, and run the show over and over again. I need you to subscribe, Brains, okay, to all of the outlets, because we are doing big things here on The Edge, and more to come. I'm working on some great interviews. So go check us out on YouTube, Spotify, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, yada, yada. You know, that's it. You know. We're all over the planet. We are here for you on The Edge with April Mahoney. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah Regera. Did I get it? Yes. Did I get it? Right? <laughs> Anyways, what you can get with hard work and persistence. <laughs> you get the name right. <laughs> All right, my dear. All right, bye-bye. Bye, Brains. Bye. Have an exceptional day. I'm counting on you. <laughs>